Um, we've assembled a, a table that represents the cross panel of the in, uh, cross section of the industry as much as possible. Um, so maybe we'll start by just getting 30 second introduction, uh, who you are, the background, um, and sort of what perspective you're going to represent or, or speak from. If we could start with Peter. Okay. Um, I'm Peter Connell, uh, I'm manager, managing director at DSRA Architecture. I've been, um, I, I've been, so I was sort of a tech, techie, you know, in a lot of ways in terms of my uh, adoption of AutoCAD early on. Um, when I entered the industry kind of late as a as an architect, a mature student. And uh, so I've been following on the technology from the very beginning and kind of frustrated with AutoCAD at the beginning and and then saw Revit early on in the, um, in about uh, 2003, you know, pretty soon when it was developed and, and have been a strong proponent of using the software because it seemed to be so much more advantageous and seemed to take more of the uh, uh, make design uh, more more related design and the tedium, taking the tedium out of AutoCAD. So I mean, that was the first introduction to it. Obviously, it's developed much more, and my understanding of it's greater, much more um, in terms of uh, what it can do. And you know, I've been using it since you know almost over 10 years, and the firm has been using it um, for the last five years, and we've been doing all of our work in Revit for for the last three or four years. So. So that's where we are. Okay. Carl? Thanks. Um, my name is Carl Hicks. I work with Fowler Bald Mitchell, uh, architectural firm here. Uh, my focus or my experience uh, is a wide range. I've, I've been uh, working with Autodesk resellers since uh, 87. So <laughs> I started. Uh, trying to implement and uh, migrate people from the hand drafting board uh, through CAD and then later on through vertical applications uh, spawning off into now BIM and 3D. Uh, so I've, I've actually experienced uh, a full spectrum of, of um, industry change. Uh, I left uh, the Autodesk reseller business uh, in uh, 2009 and uh, started working with Fowler Bald Mitchell and I act as their BIM manager there, uh, which uh, we uh, are, are still uh, going through an implementation process. Uh, so it's sometimes, it's not, uh, it's not a direct pulling off the band-aid kind of thing, approach. Uh, uh, but let's, uh, that's what I, I'll represent maybe past, present, and future, I guess. Thank okay, you. Uh, great, we'll move on to Nicholas. Uh, Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Nick Baxter, I work at O'Neill Scriven and Associates. Um, I gotta admit it's a little humbling being up here with all these uh, highly experienced individuals, but I've been in the mechanical side for about three years, and I come from a background working for a uh, structural fabrication company, the Structural Steel, and before that I was in the military as a construction technician, so I kind of got a bit of a general, well-rounded background as far as uh, construction goes, and at O'Neill and Scriven, call it a cruel act of fate maybe, but I ended up more or less spearheading our uh, our venture into the using this BIM technology and more specifically using Rivet. So um, we started out, um, we were approached by a contractor to uh, basically produce uh, some interference drawings or coordination drawings for a job that we had designed. So that's where it all started and I basically took it on with Rivet to uh, basically draw the entire model, the uh, architectural, structural and mechanical electrical and combine it all together and then transfer that into some 2D drawings that they could use on site. So it was a bit of a trial by fire and it all worked out in the end and I'm reaching the end of our second uh, job doing a similar thing. And um, hopefully from here, we're gonna take the plunge and 
try and get on board with Revit more in the design stage rather than the uh, coordination stage at the end of the job. Um, the reason I wanted to be here mainly was just so there was a voice from the engineering firms because there's the reason we haven't adopted BIM is basically I talked to a few of my superiors about it and it's the time issue like just for an example on us like if we need to run a plumbing pipe across a building a three quarter inch pipe with AutoCAD it'll take you know 10 seconds draw a line across now with the BIM approach you know we're going across but you've got to go up and down and you're zigging and zagging along ductwork and storm piping and whatnot so it's a significant time issue and it's almost like that coordination allowance at the end of the job needs to be shifted to the beginning of the job and I think that's been brought up a few times today but anyway that's me okay uh, we on to John, John uh, thanks Ian and uh, thank you uh, Ken Bim for having me here today um, my name is John Hale. I'm with the Department of National Defense. I am uh, the chief of CAD BIM. Um, my main task with uh, National Defense is implementing BIM um, across the department, um, a program for BIM and also the processes. And I started this venture back in around 2009 and um, we're still learning. Um, so I'm really happy to be here to learn. I've learned quite a bit actually hearing from the, some of the presentations earlier of how it's being, you know, some of the tools are being implemented. Um, we are really interested in the Department of, uh, of implementing open BIM standards and, and moving to that, that ability to actually use the information in an open, free way. Um, we're, we're plugged into um, Building Smart Canada and uh, also CAN BIM, and i um, really uh, glad to answer any kind of questions and learn from today, so thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Hugh Monroe, uh, Gen Info Solutions. I'm a partner in that company. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ken Bim for, uh, for inviting me here. Certainly appreciate uh, your time for being here as well. Um, I'm out of uh, Mississauga, Ontario, and what we actually do is we provide BIM services to the construction industry. So we've worked with architects, we've worked with uh, contractors, uh, mechanical, general contractor, etc., on uh, various buildings, whether that be hospitals, data centers, etc. So I, I'd like to think that I come at this from a bit of a different perspective, more of a macro perspective. Um, previous to being involved with offering the services, I actually sold the software, so I'm going back almost 10 years with, uh, with the BIM technology. So I'm um, looking forward to the discussion, and once again, thank you for being here. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Rowley Hudson. I'm uh, an assistant professor at uh, the School of Architecture in, in Halifax at uh, Dalhousie University. Um, I do research in uh, computational design and integrated project delivery, and I teach in the um, design and technology streams. Um, I've been here in Halifax for three years, and before that um, I was in the UK, where my time was split between um, doing a PhD at the Uni University of Bath, um, and I also worked as an independent consultant, um, working with uh, firms in the UK, assisting them with um, parametrically defining geometry and uh, helping with uh, building coordination. Okay, so as you see, we have a, a pretty good cross-section. The one piece that we're missing, at least from our local area, is the construction side. I don't think, is there anybody in the construction side of things in the audience at all? Okay, so we have a few, okay. So maybe you could step in and fill that role if questions come up. Um, so based on uh, sort of the backgrounds that you've heard, is there any questions to start from anyone? Anything that you've been holding in your back pocket from the presentations? I know there were some over here, but they've disappeared. No? Okay. I have a few here to start. Um, so maybe from each of them, I mean, it sounds like generally everybody's adopted on the panel here to some extent decided to make a move to adopt the technology and move towards that. What was the prime factor in making that decision? We can start with Peter. Um, well, I, I mean, uh, because uh, I was an early adopter, I, I think it was just how to make a uh, designing buildings, uh, drawing buildings, easier. <laughs> so I mean, that, that, that to me, I mean, that's what gravitated me towards the product. Um, 
to, to, to again, to take out the tedium of design, to spend more time, or drawing, and so we could spend more time on designing uh, our buildings. Um, but I think what's kept me at, me at it is um, the possibilities, really, is that's what, that's the future that, that Revit, or sorry, BIM holds for us. Um, and that it's a convergence of technologies um, that'll allow us to design better buildings, uh, better coordinated documentation, um, allowing us to carry a model that we all work on build, uh, designing in three-dimensional space and this model carries forward through into the construction realm and the contractor then takes this information um, and um, maybe perhaps even uses it as, as a, we use it as a tool for bidding um, so that all this information could be available for costing and for bidding for the contractor to use and then carry forward into the owner's hands for facilities management. So all of those things, I think, are possibilities, and that's what that's what engaged my uh, interest in in uh, BIM. When I came on board with Fallerball Mitchell, they had already uh, chosen to uh, adopt BIM, and I was basically brought on as a BIM manager as far as implementation internally. So, uh, but from what I see, uh, the choice was made to primarily stay competitive within the market, um, looking across uh, other companies throughout Canada and the US and uh, new technology on the street kind of thing and as far as promotional. Uh, but I think the main thing was to, uh, to, to stay competitive uh, in, in the market to, to, to win business uh, based on uh, new technologies. Um, I have to agree as well, like basically to keep getting jobs and keep continuing on, we've got to adapt to, uh, you know, what the uh, industry is using. And we were getting a lot of pressure from architectural firms to uh, switch over to Rivet just for the coordination aspect. And, um, you know, we, at our firm, we have a very good standard with CAD and we've got a giant library of details and schedules as I'm sure most firms do. And it's a little intimidating to kind of get out of that rut and move on to something that's totally different. And I think it's, things are kind of shaking out and there's gonna be some changes in basically the whole scheduling of construction, more so like, from what I mentioned before, we're, uh, we're looking at it at this point, like it's gonna take us longer to design the product, but in the end, you're gonna have better coordination and smoother construction. So there's gotta be a shift in those costs. And, but yeah, we're uh, basically gotta go with the flow, right? <laughs> I think just to add, you know, I think there's an expectation that um, that when you when you put down that plumbing line, mm -hmm. um, that single line, that it's understood. You understand that it needs to do this, this, and this, and go around there, um, and that there won't be any issues. Um, but you know, often there is, and we find out about them in the field later on. The contractor is scratching their head: How do we get out of this? So I think there's an expectation from our, the owners and cl our clients that this is being coordinated and we look bad when it isn't. Um, so quite frankly, we realize that it's going to take longer to do these things, but we think it's the benefit to the project, the owner, our industry, that we do do these things. And I recognize you know, we need to be compensated for that. It's not something that we've inherently been doing. Um, <coughs> but everyone expects that we are. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that's a good point. Um, I think we're seeing, I always talk to my, uh, the guy next door to me uh, about this. He's an older fella, and um, he's always harping about how we've almost got a vacuum in the industry where we've got a group of uh, much older, more experienced people, and then a group of young people 
who are less experienced. And the older people have been doing this for years, and like you say, they draw the line across the page, but up in their head, you know, they're keeping track of all these ups and downs. And the younger group coming in, it's a little more difficult, and using the rivet is, you know, it's right in front of you, it's a lot easier to see that sort of thing. John, from an owner's perspective, you know. <laughs> First, going down the line, keep this lively. Um, I, I have, a, from my view, um, as an owner, representing an owner, um, the whole process was just broken. And uh, we were not getting information back after projects or even to support projects and seeing, um, you know, when we, deliver, when we put an RFP out for a project, we we're delivering a brick. And it's like this massive document on how to deliver a project back to D&D or back to the government of Canada. And it's almost ridiculous. And uh, so we're taking a step back and kind of trying to figure out how to make that process a lot, a lot more streamlined and how to get that information flowing and get data flows. Um, and that, that was really the biggest driver for us to move into BIM. And we're nowhere near being there yet. Um, we're just starting. Um, so basically that's it in a nutshell, break, broke, break, or fixing a broken system. And uh, I think BIM, BIM and Revit are, are a bit of a, you know, I, I hear that word used interchangeably here today and I really, I find that frustrating. I, I do uh, kind of walk the line of the IFC is where we got to go, open standards is where we got to go, and uh, um, it's really hard as an owner to go to uh, a contractor or a, cons or a consultant and say, this is how you got to do your job and how to collaborate and all that. No, we're just buying construction, we're buying design, and we just want a product back. And we want to use that product and manage it for the life cycle of our building assets. So uh, it, we have a lot of work to do to sort of get you know, that information product back and define that. And I think there's a lot of onus on the owners to actually become a heck of a lot more knowledgeable and be able to ask for the right thing. And it's a bit of a challenge. And you know, internal to D&D, uh, we're a big, big uh, enterprise and you know, project managers doing one thing, technologists and, 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 and our engineering staff doing another and we're working to get that all together. So, sorry, that was a bit of a rant. But. <laughs> um, from the perspective of uh, somebody who actually sold the software and then has moved on to actually offering the services. My observations have been that it's a pretty general consensus that people are buying in to the concept of BIM and that's the way things are gonna go. You don't get too many arguments with people saying, no, I'm gonna stay 2D because that's the way it's gonna go and that's what we're gonna do. Unfortunately, what's happening it's very, very uh, cumbersome technology to adopt because essentially what you're doing is you're changing your whole workflow process. It's not CAD and many companies when they adopt 3D or BIM, they put the onus on the CAD department that this is your job now, you're gonna do this. And it's been a very, very difficult adoption um, Autodesk, with my apologies to the Bentley guys, but that's my experience with uh, Autodesk, AutoCAD, and, and, the, uh, and the Revit, has made it very easily for companies to acquire the software by throwing a couple of hundred dollars into their AutoCAD subscription, and there's your Revit. You've got it. And then the resellers might do three days of training and come back two weeks later for another three days of training, and they identify pilot projects, and everybody's got deadlines, they try to get this thing done. They can't get it done because they've been doing AutoCAD for, for 20 years. And it's a tremendous challenge. And I think Revit has been coined uh, shelfware because so many companies have acquired Revit but are sitting on a shelf. They're not using it because the next job comes along and they know how to do it in AutoCAD. And they do it in AutoCAD. And the pressures and the pressure points are just too great. Uh, I recognize that and I, I can't really identify the best way to implement, but it, it's very challenging and a lot of companies, maybe there's a lot of people in the room that are wrestling with the fact, how do I, how do I get there? How do I get there from AutoCAD uh, to BIM? It's not easy. Uh, I'm kind of a, uh, uh, in the middle where I can give you what BIM gives you uh, and, and you get it and some companies have uh, adopted that, uh, that process instead of bringing it in-house themselves. But uh, that's, that's kind of where I am getting from uh, A to Z. John, uh, I could tell you uh, my experience working in, in, in two firms um, and how it's, how it's changed. 
um, and I think you're right. The problem is it has to be driven from the top at this point. Um, and I say at this point because of um, because the the people at at the at near the bottom who are who are drawing uh, this gets more difficult. It's more challenging. I can do it faster in AutoCAD. They don't appreciate the value that it, it gives to those who are um, on on the design side, um, and how much uh, you know th this idea of coordination and uh, integration of services. Uh, so it's it's those that have the ability who design and can start designing in Revit that make the difference. And so I, I've seen it uh, fail at many firms simply because. Uh, the senior CAD technician says, no, it's too hard, or it doesn't work, it's not as fast, we're not going to do it. And the, and the partner in the firms will say, okay, well, we tried, and it's not going to work, and it fails. So it'll take some time, but uh, the 30-somethings um, that are in firms now, and maybe 40-somethings, uh, who will be in a position of decision-making, and, and they're coming up, uh, maybe within the next five years, they see the potential and they can drive the change and it'll happen. So I think we'll see a, a steady increase in the use of BIM as in the next uh, four or five years. Uh, and it won't be driven so much from the top, it'll be driven closer to the bottom. People who worked with CAD now work with Revit, see the potential and who are designing with it. So I'm pretty sure that's going to happen and I think we'll see a lot of firms change and if they haven't changed they're not changing now. It's going to be difficult to change because no matter you can't speed the process of conversion from AutoCAD to Revit. There is a process, and um, we've been at it for five years, and we're still working on it. So um, um, anyway, I think it's all going to move a lot faster soon. So just to uh, yeah to respond, um, I guess it's my turn for the uh, the question of why. I mean, talking from a I guess academic research and educational point of view the bottom line I think really is striving for better quality design and better quality buildings and a better environment um, and I think looking for ways of using computation to essentially explore a broader range of alternatives is going to lead to uh, a better uh, result so I think from uh, from my perspective a kind of looking to improve the situation is really the uh, the bottom line and, and that obviously is about you know looking into simulation investigating performance of, big, of buildings and making sure that they're better than they, they could be by um, analyzing uh, more possible alternatives. Alan Partridge uh, group two traditional architectural practice as we know it is ostensibly dead and part of the problem with new technologies is we tried to put new patchwork on old clothing so from the perspective of we've all attended the funeral, we've all said our goodbyes, what would have been the single biggest cultural change you made to move the new milieu forward? I think, um, I'll speak for our firm, um, well, two things were happening, and, and so not all firms are the same, but there's some firms that um, the architects are drawing. Um, if you're over the age of 45 or 50, let's say, you're not drawing anymore. Um, it's not required. You know, uh, the, the technicians do that. And it's important that your architects are drawing. Um, and we've lost touch with uh, our abilities to actually work with the software and draw and use it as a design tool. Um, so. It actually puts uh, the products like BIM put put design back in the hands of architects, because there's so much design that happens in the nitty gritty of putting together uh, floor plans and details. Uh, all that stuff needs the hand and the eye of, of the architect, and so it's that's one of the major changes. So we're making sure that all of our architects are drawing. They're using Revit. They're working with the technologists because there's some heavy lifting that we still need technologists to be doing and Revit allows us to be working back and forth even in the same time in one model so uh, we're working uh, in teams um, 
maybe three or four people working on a model at the same time. I work on models all the time, working back and forth with my architects, with the technologists. So um, it's, a, it's a real cultural shift in, a fun, in an interesting way. It's almost a shift backwards, you know, before CAD. You know, when we all had a hand, um, it was before my time, frankly, but the design was in the hands of the partners and the architectural technologist was there as the right hand for the architect, who would do a lot of the, the technical things, but the architect still drew. Um, now we're drawing again. It's important. Just um, following on from Peter there, with the, uh, um, I think he was kind of alluding to the, uh, uh, the capability of architects to use computers. I think the, the, the funeral that the, um, the questioner was referring to probably should have happened about 30 years ago. Um, computers, the first computers were invented in the late 1940s and were used to simulate nuclear explosions. Um, the first CAD system, I think, was invented in the 60s in, at MIT and was already fully associative and parametric. For some reason, the first desktop CAD applications chose to simulate the drawing board. Um, and I suspect there is a a problem amongst the um, architectural community, it, with the excuse of everyone here today, of course, um, that there is a, an inability to accept how powerful computers are and really demand that they are applied in an intelligent way. Because really, you know, modeling buildings compared to simulating nuclear explosions is incredibly simple. And I think if any move is made, it's to realize how powerful computers are. And we should be demanding from software developers much, much better software and software that we ourselves can, ha or we need the skills to uh, uh, extend and adapt them to make them do the things that we need to, need to do. So um, I think there is a, um, yeah, there's a need to, to kind of realize where computers have come from and how long the, the idea of CAD and BIM has been around. And it's not really a very new thing. Can you jump in with a comment on that? Sure. Um, I, I, I kind of cringe when I hear the word leave it to the software vendors because um, I think when we leave it to Autodesk, they've gone out and they've, they've made Revit for us and they've, they've gained market share and they've kind of, kind of, if you do all our stuff in Autodesk world, everything's interoperable, the world's good, go for it. You can, you can work in your, all your teams together, but reality is you can't, you do your structural analysis fully the way you've always done it, and the structural modeling software has been you know, way pre precedes BIM, and it, the two worlds just they collide because you're all stuck in Autodesk world. And I think you know, I, I think it's really important that we lean more towards the open standards development and and then really press our software vendors to go away from the my software can do it all um, and go into hey let's work with all the other vendors and, and come up with something that works for the whole industry. Um, and on top of that point, um, I think you know 20% of the cost of, uh, of your overall life cycle of your building is during design and construction. That other 80%, to me, that's where all the value is and being able to get that information back from the construction phase into my own M, um, that's everything and I want to have that data set up and structured so I can reuse it and put it into other systems that aren't Revit, that aren't Bentley, that are probably you know SAP or financial systems. So that's just my two cents. On a, uh, a similar note, um, I, I think the CAD technicians that, adopts, that adopt BIM, um, they, they have to be in a different mindset. Uh, typically with AutoCAD, you're connecting dots. You're doing these schematics, you're doing arches for doors, uh, lines for walls. Um, there's not a lot of design creativity going on going on with the use of AutoCAD. So when they adopt BIM, you're actually massing buildings. You're creating, you're, you've got the Lego in your hands and you're building buildings, unlike AutoCAD. So it's almost a new skill set altogether. So when you adopt BIM, you adopt a new technology. So that, that again is something that's very challenging. You have to change the mindset. So you're going from you know, one technology to another, which is totally even though it may be Autodesk uh, software, one is not like the other. It, it's totally new. So it's a, a total uh, change in uh, the workflow process. John, I'd say uh, not only is it a, 
a change. I mean, it's a different person that we need um, sitting at the computer. And uh, maybe they can change their mindset, but maybe it's the wrong person. You know, I, I think we demand, we need smarter people um, developing um, um, BIM models and who understand, who are willing to understand how buildings come together. And uh, some of the people that we've seen in the past, CAD drones, I call them, um, they're just not interested or capable of uh, uh, operating AutoCAD software is about, about as far as they want to get into uh, understanding how buildings go together. And the industry doesn't have much use for them, won't have much use for them in the very near future. And the people that in our firm that are working in Revit are, you know, they're the top who really are excelling and want to understand how buildings go together. And that really is who the architectural technologist used to be. Um, that is that in many ways, this is sort of my philosophical um, stance is that we've lost our best architect te technologists. These are the guys that worked with the architect. Um, they've, they've, been not, they've been sort of uh, didn't uh, catch the wave with CAD. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Um, but over time, they've focused more on drawing lines and less about how buildings go together. So um, we need to architectural technologists that understand how buildings go together. And, they're going, they're going to come. And it's probably the same in, in the engineering side of things too. Uh, uh, we need, you, it's not just your line drawers you need anymore, you need people who understand and think That's how right. this stuff goes together, because it's, yeah. Well, I think, just to compliment that, I mean, it's, you, in previously you would think in 3D, right, while you're drawing in 2D, but now, <coughs> we are losing that aspect and with Rivet, the 3D's right in front of you, or sorry, with BIM or Rivet or any other software like that, the 3D's right in front of you, so it's forcing it upon you again. You can't just worry about it down the road, think it'll sort itself out. <laughs> uh, recently, uh, an architect in um, Europe, Cass Oosterhaus, said that uh, the role of the architect is, is going away and we will refer to it as the person formerly known as architect. So in your mind, with that kind of evolution possibly in place, what would be the single thing in 30 seconds or less that you believe that future participant in the industry should possess? Uh, I, don't I don't know um, this, this architect you speak of and what his argument was why the architect uh, is fading away or, or, or is, I think our role is changing, but I think the industry uh, requires us more than ever. I'll, I'll clarify. Yeah. Um, ostensibly, we're, we're a legend in our own lunchtime. Uh, we, as an industry as a whole, uh, we've become very siloed. 200 years ago, we gave away our ability to work in construction because one individual said an architect that you can't design and build at the same time at a time when other industries were coming together as designers and producers out of which the automotive industry the aeronautical industry and the nautical industry all grew in leaps and bounds uh, we put buildings together in a similar way a ford t the door doesn't fit right the light is on the outside hanging off whereas the industry's moved along. So with that notion in mind, if we're to reinvent our uh, industry in some way and assume for a moment that in this room that the role of the architect has ostensibly disappeared, what would be that new role? Because we still need that ro a role in some form, but not in the traditional sense that we see it right now. What would you think a future architect, if we use the term architect, assume it's still around, uh, what would they need to possess? What would be the single thing, looking back, that they would have at that point in time that would make them an, an important member of the industry as a whole in this new environment? Because BIM, as a catalyst, is going to do this for us. Well, yeah, the, we've always been sort of questioned as to who, where the architects came from, and, and, and maybe it was all ego-based. 
but i think it's it's comes from the master builder you know that's where we're that's where our roots are and i think perhaps well i know that we've we've lost our way in terms of the master builder and we need to be much more closely aligned with the contractor and understand how how buildings go together but the architect in principle is 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 really uh, we're the shapers of of the environment, of the built environment. And so it's, it's really uh, the, the beauty of buildings and um, finding uh, form uh, to the functions of buildings that we need. So that, that is our primary role. Uh, but it's a complex role in terms of how you get from idea to the built form. And we're not, we're not uh, mechanics, we're not just figuring out how the door goes into the wall, um, although we need to know that stuff. Um, so there's, there's sometimes there's a separation between the types of architects, the ones that focus on are just the concept. Um, we don't, we, I don't have much room for those architects, frankly. Um, the architect is the one that has to take the idea and move it all the way through. And so um, we need architects that do that, we need, and the building information modeling helps us deliver the, the ideas uh, through to construction by helping uh, everyone on the team, as, as the architect being the, the conductor of a large orchestra of people, to bring a building to fruition. So um, these tools are, are helping us um, with that getting, getting there. So I'm not so sure whether that's ever changed. Our role has always been that. It's just that we haven't been very good at it for the last 50 years. And this maybe gives us a better opportunity to get better at it and get uh, back to where we used to be. I might add briefly that I think you can characterize future architects as uh, creative analysts of design and construction data. That's a short answer for you. I don't think we have to limit it to, uh, to the architects. I think we can look at the construction uh, industry in general. And, you know, we all know those buildings that that building is going to cost a million dollars to build. At the end of the day, it's 1.25 million or 1.3 million, and that is consistent. It's been consistent for years. Technology really hasn't changed a whole lot in the construction industry over the last 40 years. When you compare the business that we're in, the construction industry, to whether it's manufacturing or whatever the case may be, they've been working in 3D forever. And there's a reason why they've been working in 3D forever. They build their prototypes, they, they, they run tests, they, they understand what's going to happen. Why you have these uh, absorbent costs in the construction industry is you find all these problems when you go to site, when you build your building. You've got columns running into sheet metal, et cetera, et cetera, and everything shuts down and you go for the change orders, then the, the costs are run up. Um, it starts with the architect, but it goes down through the whole chain. Um, I mean, it's very, very easy to be critical of uh, this whole construction industry because they've been very, very slow to adopt technology. The technology has always been there. It's been there for years and years. But it's been very slow to change because it's expensive to change. It's, it's difficult to change. It's challenging to change. And until they change and adopt these uh, virtual build tools, um, they're going to be left behind because I don't think this is going to slow down at all. As a matter of fact, I know it won't slow down. So uh, with you, know, you, you people sitting in this room today, you know, wondering whether we should adopt this technology, you'll be forced to. You'll be forced to be out of business because you see it in scope of work more and more and more often uh, all the time and either you figure out how to do it or you go on to the next project and do it in 2D. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, Alan, but it's, you know, it's the industry as a whole that has fallen behind many, many other uh, industries. I don't even want to touch this question, Alan. <laughs> That's a really yeah. difficult one. I, I just think they'd be better communicators and better collaborators. I just want a couple of comments. Um, Alan mentioned the uh, the future, and I wanted to share a little the story that uh, I was uh, 
uh, listened to an architect speak about 10, 15 years ago in San Francisco, and he came out and he was addressing a bunch of con contractors with uh, the shades on, and he said, I'm looking into the future right now, and what I see is a hologram of the building that we are in, and I'm going to put the piece of pipe right here where the glasses show me to put it. That was kind of an aha moment for me. I thought, wow, if we ever get there, it won't be in my generation, but it's, uh, that really takes it to where we need to take it, and that's the savings in the field. And, uh, and I think it was alluded to earlier today that um, I, I, I was quite impressed, actually, of all the architects who spoke today that they are using 3D and Revit and BIM modeling because as a trade contractor in the area, I wouldn't know that. And that's a sad point because we're not, we're not collaborating, we're, n we're not communicating on that. Um, we have probably modeled many buildings that were already modeled because we needed to do it for our, our fabrication process. So I think we have an inherent problem there that we need to fix as a construction industry so we can see those savings. And you mentioned the, the straight line across the drawing. Well, who pays for all this, right? And if it's not on the drawing, then we get an argument, yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in our industry, uh, you know, an hour spent upfront planning and designing saves two in the field, and that's where your cost is. Um, so I, I would just like to put it forward if there's an effort that can be put on the architectural front to meet with Construction Association, Nova Scotia, or whatever, and, and try to see, okay, when, when you are doing um, uh, Revit drawings and a, a, a building is, is modeled and it's put out for tender as a tender package. How do we know that? It's, it just looks like 2D drawings and there's no real difference. Um, there's no information passed on to the trades that uh, they could benefit from. So I'll throw that out there for you. You have to first understand that I, I have not worked on a, pro we've been working in Revit or in BIM for personally uh, over 10 years. The firm I'm with is five or six years. The client has never asked for a BIM model. So our product is 2D drawings and specifications. That is what we produce. How we produce it is really up to us. The game is going to change when the owner says, oh, but can I get that 3D model you've got too? And then, then I'm, I'm going to say, well, you didn't ask for that in the scope of work. And it's a major investment that we've been making for years in three-dimensional modeling. And, and um, we don't, I still don't know what a BIM model is. Um, uh, but people say I've been doing it for years, but I don't know what BIM is, frankly, because I don't know what's in that model or what the expectations are. There's a lot of layering of information that could go on that BIM model that may be of great use to the owner and the contractor and who else downstream, but um, that would take more investment of time. So at the moment, we're playing and using Revit to BIM to our advantage um, exploring ways of making the process more efficient for us, perhaps making better coordinated drawings um, uh, for, for tender and for construction. Uh, so these are all benefits to me, which I'm willing to invest in, and maybe there's going to be a hope that someday somebody's going to ask for that information, and when they do, then we're going to put a price tag on that. Uh, I'll give you an example how close this is. Um, Probably, are, are you in the mechanical contract? Yeah, so are you from Atlantica? <laughs> yeah. I have your ball. <laughs> so the, uh, you know, working on a project now where um, the interference drawings were not uh, part of the contract uh, with, the, with the trades to provide. Um, uh, well, well, let me just change it. Let's just say that they're required, interference drawings are required, and the contractor is looking for our model because it's going to save them a whack of time. Um, the value of doing those interference drawings is pretty substantive um, from the owner's point of view. Um, and here we've invested all this time into de developing this model, but are we going to just turn it over 
and see nothing for the value that we've invested in that model well we're not going to just turn it over and we're waiting for owners to ask for that information so that we can put a value on it and they need to ask for it at the request for proposal stage when we put in our fees and that is going to change I would say within half a year to a year we're going to see some major vendors of architectural services are going to start asking for that information I don't know if they realize what they're asking for and we're going to have to figure out a lot of things but it's time that we start doing that and I'm sure it's happening in other areas throughout North America but it hasn't happened here yet so Peter just as an owner organization what we're lacking is the right wording to ask you for that and then having as D&D where we are a technical authority and we are delivering the construction program I deal with the contracting authority which is defense construction Canada who all they do is run and run our contracts so I get all the wording what our requirements are pass it over them they run the contract we bid it one of our biggest challenges is being sure we ask for the right things but also when I want to go to run the contract I get beaten up over the time but oh you can't go there because that's way in advance of what the market can sustain we're gonna start eliminating some firms it's not competitive so there's some challenges on that way but I'd love to show you how to write right into your scope work what you need for a model because it's going to eliminate 90% of the firms that can apply for that work so it's we're gonna have to inch toward that GSA and the United States probably the largest vendor of architectural engineering services for the American government have ratcheted up the request for the use of building information modeling in the design stages and they started off with schematic design I think it's now a design development it'll soon get to the point of asking for full contract documents and and building information modeling and that who knows it may may be actually actually using it for specification and quantity quantity surveying and all those things but we're gonna have to inch toward it but and it may be in a value-added service that we provide to clients so if client so if it can be provided by some firms you can add at it as for it as an additional service and we could put a value on that just just inside our my simple brain we're following the UK construction strategy very closely UK government has a mandate I don't know if anybody's how familiar people are in the room with the UK construction strategy but they have devised a series of touch points and they're pretty much read as resigned all the processes around design and then you know in the construction delivery and then they've really summarized it into these touch points where those are the points where they're gonna have data drops it's not about telling the telling the designer or telling the constructor how to go about their job it's like prove to me at this point in time at this touch point that you've delivered our mandate for the design and give us the information we'll now consume it so I think that really changes the game if you think that way we're not looking at you know purchasing your model we just want the data from it so I guess those are discussions that are you know and I think that the sorely locking thing is a mandate overall in Canada for any government any provincial government federal local municipal any any mandate saying you'll start doing BIM and I think that's something that we really need to be able to start putting together the constructor and designer so that's just my point well review thanks for that we are actually out of time I didn't get to any of my questions I feel hurt just kidding um, write them down we'll answer them by email <laughs> maybe one just kidding one thought that always bugs me I never actually but well, it, it was alluded to earlier um, by uh, one of the architectural presentations but the notion of the focus is still on drawings and we're talking about models and the contractor using the model and the designers using models but we're compressing everything into these pieces of paper that go out the door and they have to get uncompressed and rebuilt and uh, maybe it's a discussion we can carry on out in the hallway over a drink or something but uh, you know what what needs to change to get rid of the drawings like why are we still using drawings something that's always baffled me so maybe we'll just close with that